Good evening, everyone. Uh, today we are here again with uh, another session on the Rehabilitation Sciences Group YouTube channel. Welcome you all. Today we are having with us Dr. Fayaz Khan. He is PhD in Neurosciences. He is an Associate Professor in Department of Physiotherapy, King Abdulaziz University, Saudi Arabia. He'll be talking about neuroplasticity and brain mapping. At the same time, we have uh, with us Dr. Sagun Agrawal. He'll be moderating the session and uh, he'll be formally introducing Dr. Uh, Fayaz. So over to you, you can start uh, the session, Dr. Sagun. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Rehabilitation Science Group. Today, we are having privilege to have Dr. Fiaz Khan. We feel proud that uh, Dr. Fiaz has completed his PhD in Neurosciences from Sri Chitra Primnuval Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology, India. It's an institute of national importance under the government of India in 2013. During his research career, he has published many research papers in international journals. He is having a research gate score of 20.14 and edge index of 6 and 187 citation. We are proud of you, Dr. Piaz. And he is a peer reviewer of many international journals. In the 2011, he has presented his paper at 16th International Congress of World Confederation of Physical Therapy at Amsterdam with a scholarship from the Department of Science of Technology from Government of India. It's a proud moment for us. Dr. Fiaz is with us. He is a great scientist and a great researcher. Uh, from the physiotherapy point of view, I would like to say uh, I have seen a lot less persons who are doing a good research. With this much of the index factor is their impact factor and the citation is there. So it's a good moment for us. Dr. Fiaz, thank you for coming. Uh, good evening, one and all, and uh, I thank uh, Shogun sir uh, uh, for giving me such a wonderful introduction. Okay, and uh, you know my today's topic will be uh, neuroplasticity and brain mapping. Well, um, I will just uh, give us a brief introduction of what I am going to take. You know, uh, I have just divided this topic into three sessions, like uh, for academicians and the researchers, and as well as the clinicians. So we have given importance for all these three sectors. So going into my topic, you know, neuroplasticity, as you know, neuroplasticity is a plastic mechanism of the brain. Well, uh, but uh, I'm not trying to uh, talk much about uh, regarding the, uh, the molecular aspects. You know, uh, in the picture, you can see on the, um, the left, right-hand side, uh, the neuroplasticity happens in uh, three levels in the molecular side. It's a nano level the micro level and the meso level. So I uh, just given um, just slight brief about the, what are they happening in the molecular level level. So in the uh, nano level, you know, we have the axon sprouting, like the axon, the new axons are formed and there is more of dendrites are formed. You know, the structure of the neuron, the neuronal cell, more dendrites are formed and more of synapses are formed, okay? And in the micro level, you get more of neurogenesis. That means more of neurons are formed and angiogenesis, these neurons have been circulated, I mean, I mean supported by the, the blood vessels, and more of gliosis happens. And in the uh, meso level, as you know, when there is an edema or inflammation after the brain injury, uh, you will get a lot of factors like the uh, BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophic factors, and the neuronal growth factors have been uh, uh, um, in the uh, synaptic level. So these are what happening in the uh, molecular level. So for us, Today, I'll be not be talking about the molecular level. What our interest for today will be more on the macro level where uh, which the, the cortical organization or the reorganization and the inhibition, the facilitation, excitation, and the LTP and LTD, those kind of things which will be of more interest for us as a personal from the rehabilitation side. So what is neuroplasticity? Is the ability of the central nervous system to remodel itself. As you know, it's a plastic mechanism and the new neural connections are formed. So this is what our topic will be. So uh, talking about the plasticity, it happens as I mentioned in the neurochemical level, the neuroreceptable level, receptor level means in the synaptic level and the neuron structure level, which will be our focus today to talk about. And uh, you can see the picture of Mark Halley. He is one of the famous neuroscientists who works on, uh, who has a, done a paper on the neuroplasticity if you want, we can have the reference there. We can take the paper from that reference. Uh, so he has explained in the neuroplasticity on post-stroke brain, like 
you know, my area of interest is mostly on the brain, uh, stroke uh, subjects. So uh, the, uh, the example, examples what I'll be giving today will be most, uh, mostly on the post-stroke brain or rehabilitation of the stroke patients. So as for, as for him, he has uh, uh, mentioned four significant factors for the neuroplasticity. One is unmasking. The second one is change in membrane excitability. And the third one is synaptic modulation and the formation of new connections. So in unmasking, what is done is, you know, after the post-stroke, I mean, after stroke, what happens is there are a lot of neurons which get inhibited. So unmasking means to release this inhibited neurons back to the activity. That is what, you know, what we do during our rehabilitation happens. Change in membrane acceptability means you are changing the membrane potentials, you know, by depolarization and repolarization. Uh, you know, you can take an example like what we do in uh, any, any of the non-invasive brain stimulation like TDCS or TMS, what we do is we, uh, when we stimulate, the membrane excitability is changing. And specifically for, if we talk about specifically for TDCS, the transcranial direct current stimulation, the main mechanism is changing the membrane potential or membrane excitability. And third one is synaptic modulation. That means in the synaptic level, you will get more of LTP and LTD. That means long-term potentiation and long-term depression. That I will explain with a video in the coming slides. And that is, you can mo modulate that by giving TMS, the transcranial magnetic stimulation, which affects in the synaptic level. And the last one, like the formation of new connections. The formation of new connections, as I mentioned, the first picture is done by multiple process, like uh, uh, the axon sprouting, dendritic sprouting, and synaptogenesis. So coming to the next slide, I'll just show a video of what exactly in a schema and schematic uh, uh, representation of the neuroplasticity. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently. So I'm taking a taking pause here. You can, you know, what is uh, neuroplasticity or in the, uh, the video you can see. And see, I've taken an example, like say for example, we are trying to learn a new task, like uh, trying to learn a guitar, playing a guitar. What happens is when you start playing it, the pathway is very narrow, but when we do multiple, time, multiple times, like repeat it more time, the pathway which connects the activity to the, from the brain to the, uh, the peripheral uh, muscles will become, will become more and more stronger. That is called the long-term potentiation. So when you stop doing it, or when you stop practicing it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, what happens is this pathway or this tract becomes narrow. And later on, we'll forget those activities. That's called the long-term depression. So I'll continue with the video. Learn a new task or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more. And this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. So by the video, you can see that you can rewire the brain and that's what happening in most of the rehabilitation techniques what we do. So coming into the next slide, it's the brain reorganization or otherwise we call it as 
cortical reorganization because most of the activity is con controlled by the cortex. As I mentioned before, brain reorganization takes by mechanisms which is mentioned before, like the axonal sprouting. The axons in the, uh, in, on the neurons get sprouted and form new connections. And that is called the brain reorganization. Coming to the next slide, Actually, before going into the different aspects of uh, brain reorganization or cortical reorganization, I'll just uh, uh, go through some of the biomarkers or you know, uh, some of the tools uh, to use to measure this neuroplasticity. That is something of a research interest. So I'll just come into that. So according to the concerns found by a lot of neuroscientists, you know, these are the, uh, you can find a lot of names here, like Lara Boyd, Cohen, and uh, uh, the Kramer, my, so these scientists, you know, and Kathy Stina, so these are the well-known renowned scientists in the field of uh, neurosciences and neurorehabilitation. So why I mentioned the names of these people are like, you know, these are, uh, so if you want to read some good articles or good uh, papers on neurosciences and neurorehabilitation, just try to read papers of these scientists so that you get a very good robust research articles. And according to their consensus, they have classified the biomarkers or the uh, tools to measure the neuroplasticity into two categories. One is the category of the biomarkers used for the structural and biomarkers used for measuring the function. But there are a lot of biomarkers here, but out of that, I took a very, uh, three biomarkers, one from structure and two from the function, which is most commonly used and to make it simple for you. So I'll just briefly go through the, these three biomarkers and how it works because these biomarkers, maybe you may at some point of time, may encounter in your clinical or research or academic career. <coughs> Sorry. So these are the three biomarkers. One is the functional MRI or fMRI. The second one is diffusion tensor imaging, or we simply say it as tractography. The third one is the transcranial magnetic stimulation. Hope you all know about these things. I'll just go a glimpse on that. First, I'll talk about the functional MRI. You know, functional MRI works with the procedure of the bold uh, oxygenation and deoxygenation level. I'll just give an... Um, uh, brief idea about functional MRI. It's like a normal MRI. What they do is they just uh, keep the patient inside the MRI console and ask to do some activity. Mostly, you know, the thumb activity is done, the activity of the thumb, because we have the gadgets, uh, gadgets to, uh, which, is, which can activate the thumb inside the MRI console. That is the most standardized uh, uh, tool inside the MRI console. Might be they take around five, eight to 10 minutes extra to do a functional MRI. And patient does this activity and the MRI is stored and then it's processed after that. So what happens when you do a thumb activity is that, you know, when you move the thumb or any movement in, inside the MRI console, what happens is uh, the, the area, the functional area in the cortex, I mean, in the precentral uh, pre uh, pre gyrus, gyrus, it will get activated. That means more of blood supply is going to that particular area of the thumb. So what happens is more of oxygenation and deoxygenation is taking place in that area. And that is picked by the MRI. And that is processed to make a functional MRI. So you can see this picture that uh, the uh, the yellow area, which is more, uh, I mean, more activity is taking place in that area, and surrounding red area is less activity. So we can see these functional MRI pictures of samples here. Yeah. So you can see in this picture uh, the functional MRI of a post-stroke brain in healthy subjects and also in in stroke patients on the. Uh, up uh, the, uh, the picture on that side, the A picture on the left side, we can see the functional MRI of a stroke patient. And this on the right side, you can see the functional MRI of the healthy control. I'll go to explain this picture on the later and in the coming slides. I'm just skipping from here. And this, you can see this uh, functional MRI taken at one month, two months, third month, four, five, and six months. See the change in the pre-central gyrus, the motor area, how much uh, the activity has happened uh, from the first month to six months. The more and more areas or more activities happening in this area after a post -stroke, on a post-stroke brain. Coming to the next uh, biomarker or tool to assess the uh, neuroplasticity, it's called the DTI or the diffusion tensor imaging, or simply we can say it as a tractography. Tractography means graphing the tracks. You know, if you can see the picture, it's, you know, it's a beautiful picture that we give after uh, the tractography. I can just explain it's same procedure, how we do an uh, MRI. Uh, same, uh, they have to, uh, the patient has to be put on the console for might be for extra five to eight minutes. And the same procedure, patient doesn't know anything and uh, the MRI is taken and it's processed for the DTI. They use a separate paradigm for doing a DTI or tractography. You can see this picture. On the right side, you can see a color picture. On the left side, you can see an MRI. Well, uh, you can see uh, around, around area where you, the, the, the lesion is there on stroke on the left side. 
So what they, they do is they measure the tracks, the volume of the tracks and the number of tracks and compare with the normal side. So you can know how much difference is there between the normal corticospinal tract. That is uh, exactly the corticospinal tract, the CST, at the level of uh, internal capsule. So you can know the number of tracks, volume of the tracks, and compare with the uh, normal side or compare with the normal healthy subjects. So this is how you measure the tracks. You know, this can be used, this tool can be used before the rehabilitation and the after rehabilitation or pre-test and uh, pre-experiment and post-experiment. You can see the difference in your research uh, studies. And this tractography can also be used to uh, find the track interactions between the three uh, different cortical areas like the M1 is the motor area, the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor area. And regarding this, I'll come back to this uh, regarding the cortical reorganization. So we will discuss this later on in the coming slides. Well, the third tool uh, for uh, investigating uh, the neuroplasticity is an, uh, it's called a transcranial magnet stimulation. Those who are in the field of neurosciences or neuro rehabilitation might be knowing about this. This can be used, TMS can be used uh, as an investigative and as well as a treatment procedure. So here I'll be talking about the investigative procedure and then later on in the slides, I'll talk about the treatments. Now, uh, TMS means if we are giving a just brief intensity of current or magnetic current through the motor cortex, uh, and we will detect that from the uh, peripheral muscles. So what we do is it's a coil is like a uh, figure of eight coil. And what we do is we uh, directly hit on the uh, hotspot. It's called the, uh, the uh, motor area of corresponding motor area. And we get the deflection by an EMG uh, on the contralateral side. Basically, we take the FDI, the first dose in Troche, or the abductor policies previous as a target muscle. So you find out the uh, muscle, uh, the area which is corresponding to the on the contralateral hemisphere and given stimulation, one stim single stimulation, so that we get the integrity of the corticospinal tract, the connectivity of the corticospinal tract from the cortex to the contralateral um, upper limb. So there are a lot of new uh, recent advancement in this area, like there are something called the neuro navigation. Now we don't have to do, uh, hit uh, in a blind, blind spots, like the, the neuro navigation uh, mechanisms give you uh, the exact place where the motor area is located by the MRI. They, it will spot you where to, where to give stimulation. So it's so advanced nowadays. That's, those were the three uh, biomarkers that we use for neuroplasticity, measuring neuroplasticity, the functional MRI, the DTI and the TMS. Now, just skipping on to the back to the cortical reorganization, more of academic concern. Uh, we'll just talk about the cortical reorganization. And you know, cortical reorganization by the neuroscientists, they call it as rewiring of the brain. In fact, we actually do the rewiring of the brain. Uh, explaining about the rewiring of the brain, I will make it more simple for you. Like, you know, the cortical spinal tract. In the right hand side, you can see the cortical spinal tract from the cortex to the spinal cord. And left hand side, you can see the brain areas. So I'll be talking only about the brain areas like the motor area, you know, the primary motor cortex, which is on the presenal gyrus, the supplementary motor area, the premotor cortex. So, you know, these are the areas which gives you, the, uh, which produces function, a motor function of, for an individual. You know, uh, we have other areas also concerned like the putamen, the deep brief matter structures like basal ganglia and the putamen, which also contributes uh, for the motor activity. But for now, for making simple for you, I'm just concerning only about the areas which are on the motor cortex and surrounding areas on the prefrontal cortex. So considering about the M1, we represent as M1 is the motor area, the primary motor area. The M1 is concerned with the movement execution, you know, the M1 or the motor area that we know is just doing the movement what is planned by the other areas. So coming to the next area is the premotor cortex. The PMD is the dorsal premotor cortex. You know, that is a critical area which plans and select the movement. And you have something called the DLPFC is a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the supplementary motor area, which helps in the movement cognition and something called the premotor, ventral premotor cortex, which helps in the prehension and manipulation of the upper limb, like the hand movements. So, you know, all these areas, the PMD, the PMV, DLPFC and the SMA, just plans and select and ask the M1 or the motor area or the, the primary motor area to do the movement. So actually they are planning and they ask the M1 to do the movement. So this, you want to understand this mechanism happening in a uh, voluntary movement. So 
Now coming into the more theoretical aspect of rewiring of the brain, there's a very good paper done by Shailesh uh, and uh, It's called the rewiring of the brain published in neuro rehabilitation. It's, they have written very well, like they have made my, the rewiring of the brain in a more simple way. And I'll just, uh, just briefly explain what they have mentioned there. You know, uh, the structures, it's a schematic representation of the structures which I mentioned before, like the uh, M1, the premotor cortex, DLPFC, and SMA. SMA is in the mid, uh, mid line, so uh, one side is for right and one side for the left. Okay, you just see, the look onto the picture on the left side. It is a connectivity between all these structures like M1, PMC, the, uh, the DLPFC, and SMA on a normal human brain. So they, have, they are being interconnected. This is just a schematic representation. So what happens in a post-stroke brain? Say, for example, is the stroke is happening on the M1, the motor area. What happens is the, pre, the PMC, the picture on the right side, the PMC, the premotor cortex, gives additional connections, or you can say cortical reorganization, additional connections to the M1, as well as the PMC, or the premotor cortex, gives more connectivity to the spinal cord, the spinal heart flow, and to the particular area on the representing the lower peripheral organs. So this is what happens in a post-stroke brain. Say if, if, if the brain or the lesion, or the post-stroke lesion is more, much, much larger, what happens is larger means it is also involving the M1 as well as the PMC, premotor cortex. What happens is the PMC, the premotor cortex from the opposite side will connect to the M1 or will connect to the corticospinal tract of the opposite side. And this is done through, you know, there's only one connection between the one hemisphere to the other, that is the uh, corpus callosum. That's called the transcallosal. That is from one, corpus, one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. So this is done by that mechanism. So the opposite hemisphere supports the affected hemisphere to do that. Okay, so that is about this cortical reorganization. And now I'll explain about one mechanism, which is more important in our rehabilitation. And we, we, we encountered every day, all the day, uh, during our treatment of patients, I mean, uh, to be, uh, particularly regarding the stroke patients, that's called the interhemispheric competition. Okay, so I will explain this interhemispheric competition by a picture here. So be with me because this is something confusing, but I'll try to make it simple for you. So interhemispheric comp competition is what happening in all of us. It's not really for, it's all for us. Well, I'll talk about the first picture. You know, on the left-hand side, the picture A, this is an interhemispheric inhibition happening in the interhemispheric competition happening in a normal brain. You can see that when the normal brain, like us normals, when we move our both hands or one hand or right hand or left hand, the interhemispheric competition is balanced. It's same, you can see the arrow marks, it's balanced. Okay, it's, so sorry, in A, uh, when we are stable, I mean, we are not doing anything, it's balanced. Say for in the, the picture B, what happens is in normal subjects, normal subjects, when we try to move our left hand, say for example, left the green, the mark on green, a picture B, the left hand is the mark B, uh, mark in green. When you move, try to move the left hand, what happens is the, uh, the opposite hem, the contralateral hemisphere, the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere will activate more, activate more, and it will be overruling the norm, the other hemisphere, the left hemisphere. That is what happening in a normal brain. Say coming to the C, picture C, which is, of, which is more interested for us for, as a specialist in the neuro rehabilitation. Uh, this is for a post-stroke brain. You can see the lesion like on the right-hand side, uh, the right hemisphere. And uh, when you move uh, the contralateral hand or the left hand, and when the lesion is on the right side, it's called ipsi lesional. The, the, the affected hemisphere is called the ipsi lesional. So when you move that, what happens is the contralateral hemisphere or the normal hemisphere overacts. It overacts and inhibits the ipsi lesion hemisphere, or it overacts and inhibits the affected hemisphere. That is what happening in a post-stroke brain. So this is what mechanism what happens after after stroke. Uh, so what we have to do is to balance or inhibit the normal uh, inhibit the normal hemisphere and facilitate the affected hemisphere. That is a mechanism what we used to do in all of the most of the rehabilitation techniques we use. And I'll come to that uh, uh, into a few of the rehabilitation techniques we use, and I'll explain the mechanism. So hope you understand this mechanism of interhemispheric competition or interhemispheric inhibition. It's also called the transcallosal inhibition because it happens to the corpus callosum. So what we have to do is we have to break this transcallosal inhibition. Now I'm just giving a small example of uh, uh, a small example of 
uh, the interhemolytic inhibition uh, just uh, it's nothing regarding to rehabilitation just see the video this cycle is normal normal cycle it's a it's it's called a backward brain cycle just see when the handle is moved to the left side the tire turns right see here this is called the backward brain cycle just see how he's making this he's challenging the audience to do that it's quite difficult to do that i'll explain the mechanism now it's not that when it's not like easy that how we think it's called the brain uh, backward brain cycle Why are you? So that that's called the backward brain cycle. And you know, uh, when you turn the handle to the right side, the tire turns to the left side. So you know, this uh, this guy on the, the picture here, his car name is Justin. He found out this mechanic. He, he tried to make this, and you know. uh this happens our uh, mechanism of the uh, interhemispheric competition so if we know cycling it will be difficult for you to do this but if you are not a new learner it will be easy for you to learn this because you have already learned the mechanism now it's difficult difficult to relearn this mechanism and uh, uh, to learn a new task so destin tried on it and you know if he, he he tried on it and he took around 6 to 8 months to learn this uh, this cycling of this uh, backward uh, brain cycle but you know fortunately his son he's 6 uh, years old he tried and he learned in 2 months that means that the people who are young their neuroplastic changes is more faster than the adults and one of the wonderful thing is that you know this guy his name is kumar and you know he is uh, he is the one having the guinness record of the uh, the uh, having uh, making the maximum kilometer i mean maximum distance in 1 hour you know he is from my state i mean my place but the fortunate thing is that he is a physical therapist so he he holds the guinness record world record for having uh, the ma maximum number of dis maximum distance in a uh, in an hour so this is called backward brain cycling and quite example of an interhemisphere competition or inhibition and there's one more paper by the uh, team from uh, it's called the christian griffiths they work with the max planck institute and uh, it's called the reorganization of the brain it's same as rewiring of the brain and they also explain the same mechanism which i explained like uh, explained the previous uh, articles like interhemispheric competition in a post stroke brain so this is also they have explained this with the functional mri you can just take the picture on the upper side the picture a you can see two pictures one for the patient one for the healthy controls okay this picture is there in the coming slides i will explain that later on or might be this time ex this the same group by the kissing defix has published a, a, another paper on the connectivity of brain after post stroke uh, and published in the lancet neurology you know that's one of the best journals in the field of neurology yeah this is a picture which uh, which i can explain in uh, detail like you know uh, the first uh, the picture on the left hand side the upper one the a picture you have patients uh, post stroke patient uh, you have you can see the uh, lesion on the left side and healthy control what happens is the patient is moving the affected hand when he is moving the affected affected, affected hand means the uh, the hemiplegic hand on the right hand uh, what happens is they have an activity on the affected hemisphere or the left hemisphere as well as the activity is happening on the normal hemisphere that is proved i mean the interhemispheric inhibition is proved by this functional mri on the post stroke patient but on the other side if you see the healthy controls when they move the right hand only the uh, left hemisphere is activated the right hemisphere is doesn't have any activity so this is this by this functional mri we can see that the uh, the normal hemisphere is inhibiting the affected the ipsilation hemisphere now on the coming to the uh, picture on the right hand side you can pictures uh, we can see the picture uh you can see the activity or the connectivity be between uh, the structure the cortical structures which i mentioned the m1 the pmc and the uh, sma from the day 2 to uh, m3 that month 3 you can see that initially there was the connectivity was very poor and when we come down to gradually 
uh, to my third month or to the day 11, the connectivity is made much more stronger. That means the cortical reorganization has been proved by functional MRI. And this on the right side has been proved by the diffusion tensor imaging or tractography. And the last slide on the theoretical aspect here, uh, there are a lot of princi the, uh, principles like the 10 principle, which has been explained by Jeffrey Klein by in one of the article. You can download this article if you like. And I'm not going to detail all these uh, principles of neuroplasticity. I will just go through it uh, just uh, briefly. You know that uh, most of the mechanism, you know that uh, one is the first one is the use it or lose it. That means how much you use. Uh, if you use it, you can gain or you will lose it. The same like LTP and LTD, the long-term potentiation and long-term depression. And uh, this lose it means long-term depression. And use it and improve it. You use it more time and you can improve it. That is called long-term potentiation. Specificity means you have when you rehabilitate a patient, you should be specific to a particular task. Then so that you get more of the cortical reorganization or connectivity to do that particular area or a particular tra track which is uh, activating that function. Repetition matters. You know that uh, more the repetition we do, the more the rehabilitation we get. So neuroplasticity, one of the principles is repetition. Intensity matters. You have to do more intensity exercises. And you have to keep in mind that you should not increase intensity above its threshold so that it won't adversely affect the neuroplasticity mechanism. So you have to adhere to the guidelines proposed by the, uh, might be the, um, the World Stroke Organization or the a lot of rehabilitation uh, organizations uh, like APTA have declared, I mean, produce guidelines for rehabilitation. So you have to adhere to the guidelines and see what is the intensity, what is the repetition we have to give for a stroke patient. And we have to follow the guidelines or adhere the guidelines. Time matters. Time means, you know, uh, if you do the rehabilitation in the acute stage within, I mean, not within, after 24 hours, so start within 24 hours because that's recommended. Before 24 hours, it's not recommended for rehab. Very early mobilization is not recommended. So we compare uh, with, uh, from uh, doing a very early rehabilitation and we compare between subjects who have been rehabilitated after four or five months, you get more rehabilitation or more neuroplasticity in patients who have been done in acute rehabilitation. So time matters. Age matters. You know that age, age is one of the factors. As I mentioned in the previous example, like young people, young, young, young subjects are more prone for neuro, neuroplasticity when compared to the older adults. Transfer means we have to, we have to try to transfer this uh, uh, neuroplastic mechanism to other. For example, if you're giving a uh, stimulation like the transcranial magnetic stimulation on the motor area, particularly in the motor area on the brain, what happens is you are giving and the, you are finding out the uh, uh, hand area and you're stimulating it. But at the same time, you are stimulating the whole area. That means you get transfer of this neuroplasticity to the whole upper limb or the whole one, one side of the body. Inf interference means it's like you have to prevent interference of other factors into this. Like for example, same, same example we can take uh, the brain stimulation, the non-invasive brain stimulation. Like if you are giving the brain stimulation, uh, not NIBS, after the motor activity, what it does is it will inhibit the activity. So the preferable to give uh, the uh, uh, most of the brain stimulations before the activity so that it facilitates the motor activities which is taking part after the stimulation. So you have to consider this principle while you are rehabilitating patient to enhance more of neuroplasticity in our rehabilitation field. Now, coming to the clinical aspects, there are a lot of uh, procedures or a lot of, a lot of uh, interventions which are used to prime this uh, neuroplasticity. Okay, we can uh, uh, classify that as, as stimulation-based priming, motor imagery, movement-based priming, pharmacological priming, and sensory-based priming. And these are the, I mean, in stimulation-based priming, you have a lot of the non-invasive brain stimulation techniques like RTMS, TMS, and uh, uh, TDCS. In motor imagery, you have mirror therapy. Movement-based, you have the repetitive movements, what we do in the physical rehabilitation of uh, 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 task-specific training and, and aerobic training. And pharmacological-based uh, priming, you have non-epinephrine, which is used um, by uh, physicians that can be used as a, to facilitate the uh, neuroplasticity, but you have to consider the side effects of that. Sensory based priming, like the sensory stimulations to muscle and mice, muscle vibrations. So these are the, uh, the interventions that we use to prime or uh, facilitate neuro rehabilitation. Of that, I'll be talking a few things like the uh, mentioned here the constraint induced movement therapy, bilateral arm training, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So 
these are three techniques which I taken into consideration for uh, today's talk because we don't have much time to talk about all these uh, priming techniques. So these are these might be the uh, techniques that we use commonly in our rehabilitation practice. So you know about uh, constraint induced movement therapy (CIMT) and as far as literature say, that the most have the the, the 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 therapy which has the maximum number of evidence, which is level one evidence in all the literatures and all the guidelines. You know what is CIMT, and I'm not going to explain what is CIMT because you are just constraining the uh, normal hand so that you are facilitating, you can facilitate the uh, affected hand. So you think about from, uh, in principle is not learn non use, you know that. You just think about in a way which I explained in interhemisphere competition, what happens in CIMT. You have to think about when you give CIMT or any of the rehabilitation techniques, you should think about in mind what is happening inside the brain. So uh, same picture, which I'm coming back. So take the picture C, you know, I explained before what happens in a post-stroke brain is that when there is a stroke on the, uh, in the uh, on hemisphere, like FC dash in hemisphere, the normal hemisphere overacts. So what happens in CIMT? Just think from your side, you can get the answer for that. Like when you constrain the normal hand, when you constrain normal hand, what happens is the normal hemisphere or the contralation hemisphere is inhibited. The activity is inhibited and you do shaping activities on the affected hand, right? So affected hand, so that the ipsilateral hemisphere or the affected hemisphere is facilitated. Thereby you balance the interhemisphere competition. That is a mechanism happening in the CIMT. Coming to the, the next one, bilateral arm training. You know what is bilateral arm training? You do uh, the activities with both hands because you know bilateral arm training, you know, you, you, your brain is uh, accustomed to few activities like when, for example, if you are trying to open a uh, bottle, what happens you suddenly open a bottle means you hold the bottle in the left hand, always your brain, that means your brain is always accustomed to that, your right hand opens the lid. So you cannot do the other way. It's very difficult because like the, the backward cycle mechanism, what we do is you do this, you don't do this. So what happens is bilateral arm training, you should you 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 the bilateral arm so that you balance the interhemisphere competition. So, Taking the picture here, same picture C on the right hand side, what you do in bilateral arm training is you balance the IHI or the interhemispheric competition or interhemispheric inhibition. That is a mechanism happening in the uh, bilateral arm training. And the last one on the rehabilitation aspects, which we are discussing today, is uh, the repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. I have mentioned about the TMS, it's a single pulse. We used to measure the neuroplasticity uh, uh, by uh, it's, it's an um, uh, to, uh, investigative tool. So here, what they do is we, do, we give repetitive stimulation so that it's an, it can be used as a rehabilitative uh, te technique. You know, what we do is we use the one, one hertz. That means one hertz is inhibitory and more than three hertz is facilitatory. So usually for RTMS, the, uh, the protocols we use is one hertz stimulation to inhibit and 10 hertz stimulation, RTMS, to facilitate. So what here we do is we give the inhibitory stimulation to the, you can see in the picture, to the contralational or the normal hemisphere and facilitate the stimulation, the 10 Hertz to facilitate on the ipsilational or the affected hemisphere. Thereby you balance or break the interhemispheric inhibition or you break the transcalosal inhibition. You are, you are inhibiting the transcalosal inhibition. So that is a mechanism happening in the repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or any of these uh, non-invasive brain stimulation like TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation or any of this TBS, theta burst stimulation, whatever you use, you use, you use this principle of inhibiting the uh, contralation hemisphere and facilitating the ipsilation hemisphere. So that's about the mechanism of the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I, uh, and this, by this time, I'll be uh, stopping my, ending my, uh, lecture on the neuroplasticity and brain mapping. So uh, this is my uh, profile on the research gate. If you will have to know my areas of interest, you can go to my research gate, or if you want any queries regarding research or anything regarding neuros neurosciences, you, uh, I have given my um, contact number and email ID on the first slide. You can take down that. And thank you for a patient listening. Thanks a lot. So, so Shagan sir. Yes, Dr. Fayaz. Yes. Yes, Dr. Harpreet is here. He'll be okay. moderating further. 
so hope it was uh, you were okay it was wonderful lecture dr fayez yeah thank you because it was yes, okay yes. i mean uh, the voice and the pictures everything was clear right yes yes very yes, well uh, dr fayez good evening uh, yeah good evening. it was a wonderful lecture uh, we just had a few quest queries uh, i would not say questions but a few queries from your talk uh, yeah. one was uh, uh, how do you uh, propose a therapy Uh, during different stages of rehabilitation uh, based on the options of treatment mm -hmm. that you have given uh, like when do you choose a bilateral arm training versus a cimt you know that is one of the critical question i when i asked for some of the neuroscientists here when i was attending in work attending right. and conference but even i didn't get an exact answer for that but i thought okay. in my mind of some of the, the mechanisms here you know that is the most critical question you can ask for neuro neuro rehabilitation specialist what is the mechanism of using a cimt and the bilateral arm training because it's contradicting you know one is used in the one cimt you say that you don't you do, should not use the uh, normal hand you should constrain on the other hand you should you are asking them to use the both hands you know one is the selection of the patient you know in the cimt uh, you select the patient like you should at least have uh, you know a minimum degree of 10 degrees of finger extension and 20 degrees of wrist extension so that to give cimt for bilateral arm thing bilateral arm training we are not using uh, we don't have any guidelines for uh, for this uh, particular uh, range of movement in the upper limb but you know bilateral arm training can be used uh, also with the you know different equipments like cap cs i have shown you some robot equipments you can use any any, any of these uh, external equipments to do that but cimt you need if when you select the patient they need at least because the you know cimt uh, you know the physiology behind cimt is learn non use so you can check right. whether the patient is learn non use and also right. you you can select it select the patient by the movement of the extension of the wrist and extension of hand and mm -hmm. then you select the patient and you you should decide it's critical thinking from the uh, therapist side whether which treatment to be taken okay and uh, there was another uh, query on youtube asked and one, that... i just uh, to just to add one more thing in the, regarding cimt and bit bat uh, if you ask me the uh, um, evidences for the literature review there is uh, till now there is only one study done comparing the cimt and bat and that study was done and published in neuro rehab and neuro research and from taiwan they have done a very wonderful study but uh, slightly improvement in the inside of cimt Right. Okay, uh, and just one more query was there. Uh, yes. Like we are using RTMS. Yes. Uh, and if you have a choice between RTMS and TDCS, uh, in your experience, uh, when and which one would you choose in different stages? Like, uh, would you choose TDCS before RTMS, or either of them, and or it can which one would it be? okay because i can give the answer for that because my research area was completely on the uh, tbs i mean the non invasive brain stimulation there is one more paradigm called the pta bus stimulation so when comparing between rtms and the tdcs you know the rtms i mentioned in the first few slides like rtms work on the principle of the magnetic stimulation tdcs works with the principle of the direct stimulation on the, uh, the the external scalp so you know the physiology is also completely different one works with the magnetic principle of electromagnetic induction second works with the principle of uh, just uh, the electrical current we are just using a 2 milliampere to 5 milliampere electrical current for tdcs so rtms directly uh, stimulates the synaptic level neuron neuron level but tdcs on the other hand uh, it's, it's stimulating you know it's changing the membrane potential outside the brain so they are changing membrane potential that is physiology behind that you if you ask about clinical aspect for uh, literatures comparing tdcs and rtms there is no such literature which compares tdcs and rtms because this is completely different mechanism but when you talking about from the point of view from our side economical concerns when you consider about tdcs is more much uh, cheaper than the rtms because rtms machine is very expensive and as a physical therapist we are more safe in using the tdcs because it's almost like a stimulation what we use and you know the effects of tdcs nowadays we can see that the tdcs has is giving more results than compared to the rtms effects in most of the literature but it's not come into the guidelines or in none of the guidelines suggest that to use tdcs or rtms for rehabilitation of stroke patient is still on the research aspects and it can be nowadays it's uh, tms is used as an a tool to find the neuro uh, uh, plasticity by finding the motor threshold and now in in the study i mean from the university of auckland the catastino team they have using the tms single pulse tms to predict the stroke recovery 
they are using one of these tools as uh, predicting this stock recovery. So these are the, in a nutshell, you can say, uh, depending upon the economic concern, and as a physical therapist, I prefer to use, because I have not uh, used TDCS, I was working on TBS and TRTMS, I think, uh, and even um, easy to use, like it's a small machine, right? So better to use TDCS because, you know, there are a lot of scientists, you know, uh, from the University of Gardingen by Michael Nishay, and, you know, from the University of Oxford, uh, they are using the TDCS for uh, upper limb and lower limb. They're doing a very good, wonderful studies on TDCS. So in that same sense, if you ask me, I prefer to use TDCS as a rehabilitation tool. And you just asked a good question for me. <laughs> Uh, your voice is, I think, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yes. yeah. So, apart from the motor or the pre motor area, yeah. have you ever tried brain stimulation on areas other than this? Uh, I tried to find out uh, find areas on the lower limbs, uh, motor area, but no, other areas I have not tried any uh, before. But I have, I have done a study, we have in, when I was doing my research, once a study on uh, narcolepsy, you know, what narcolepsy uh, So. Uh, sleep patients. There are a lot of studies coming from, you know, it's very, uh, it, the brain stimulation is very promising for the psychiatric patients sure. and uh, for the depression patients and cognitive disorders and for speech, they are using it. Sure. And they are using the cellular stimulation even for the movement disorders. In our okay. institute where I was working with, they use for all these conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, from my experience, I've used for narcolepsy. They have given a result for narcolepsy. But mm -hmm. uh, I cannot comment on that because I'm not sure. from that area. Right. Sure. So I'm from the uh, okay. more from the rehabilitation side. I have I to understand. Work. I understand. Thank you so much, Dr. Fares, for a wonderful lecture and a, a elaborative explanation on the aspects of neuroplasticity and the tools that a physiotherapist can use uh, to enhance this neuroplasticity favorably. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you once again, thank Dr. Fares. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you all you for y'all for inviting me for such lecture in your platform so that I can share my ideas to people in India because it's, I, it's our privilege. Thank you. <laughs> and hope that I can make more lectures on different aspects. Definitely, we would be uh, making more uh, series of these lectures. That's Definitely. Right. We want key, you should take more and more lecture on.